Hello, uh, Tess here. I present the Statistically Insignificant podcast. This video is a remastered and shortened version of our very first episode, talking about the effectiveness of contraceptive methods, how it's measured, and looking at a couple of different methods, including one that is not as well known as it should, because it is the most effective contraceptive method out in the market. This is being released because uh, people in America who can become pregnant have fewer protections all of a sudden because of the overturning of Roe v. Wade than they did even a day ago. This has been a long time coming, it's not a surprise, but uh, it is horrific and it's going to kill people. Stay safe out there. Welcome to Statistically Insignificant, a podcast with visual aids about statistics in everyday life. My name is Tess, my pronouns are she and they. With me today is Bart. How you doing, Bart? I'm good. Um, Bart How, my pronouns are he and him. So today we're going to be talking about contraceptives, how they are measured in their effectiveness, which is not very well explained to patients, and what that means for long-term users in particular. I am going to put this upfront disclaimer here. This is not medical advice. I am not a medical doctor. Decisions about contraceptives often have other things going on than just the statistics as well. This is just for educational purposes, and hopefully everybody learns something from it, including me. So the first thing we're going to talk about is how we measure the effectiveness of a contraceptive. It's really hard to determine when a pregnancy hasn't happened that otherwise would. This is true of events in general, from car crashes to coronavirus cases. What you can do instead is look at how many pregnancies do occur among people using a contraceptive versus the general population who are not or who, or who are on other methods. This is usually stated as a percentage. Info sheets or sex education will say something like, condoms are 90% effective, or the implant is more than 99% effective. What this represents is if a group of people are using a method, which is say, we'll go with 97% effective, what these represent is that if a group of people are using a method which is, say, 97% effective in the first year of use, you expect 97% of that people to not become pregnant, and 3% of them to become pregnant. So this is a first year of use. 97% of users do not have a pregnancy. What that means is the rest of the people, that 3%, do expect to have a pregnancy. So you can think of it as 100% minus effectiveness is equal to failure percentage. 90% effectiveness gives you 10% failures, 1 in 10. 80% effectiveness gives you 20% failure rate, 1 in 5, and so on. These numbers usually come from clinical trials, so when the method is being developed you will have some number of medical, quite regimented trials that are run, and they look at the numbers from that. But there are also statistics on effectiveness that comes from looking at what happens in the general population once the contraceptive methods are used there, and we'll talk more about that later. In general, this is not a bad metric. It has the very straightforward interpretation that the bigger the effectiveness number, the better the contraceptive is at preventing pregnancy. That makes it really easy for people to compare the different methods on that basis, even if they don't have like a bigger understanding of what the number actually represents. For me, I was looking at like the implant as opposed to the contraceptive pill and saying implant has a bigger number for effectiveness, that means it's better, that means that's what I will choose. We may or may not be able to assume that the effectiveness is constant year on year. So if you have something like your implant, which lasts for three years, what happens in the first year may or may not be the same as what happens afterwards. And this is one of the limitations of this as a statistic. So I'm going to just real quick underline this first year of use bit, because we're going to talk about that a bit more. It's pretty rare for somebody to use contraceptives for only a year, and people like me who don't want kids are looking at 20, 30 years of ongoing contraceptive use. There are long-term contraceptives like IUDs, interuterine devices, hormonal implants that have like 3, 5, 10 year lifetimes. How effective they are over that lifespan may not be captured in this first year of use number. And one of the shortcomings of it, doctors don't talk to patients about this. I never had a conversation with anybody about 
what a lifetime of use of a contraceptive would look like in terms of the probability of becoming pregnant. Given that what most patients get is this single year figure, we can actually use that to give us an idea of what is going to happen for longer use. We're going to do this for 20 years, but the same approach works for other time periods as well. All estimation methods make some assumptions in order to work, right? So I'm going to write down our assumptions here. First off, because this is a rough approximation and because this is the data that we have available, we're going to assume that the probability of failure doesn't change over time. I'm going to say up front, this is unrealistic. But as a first effort to get an idea of what long-term use looks like, it's not a bad way to go. You can then refine that method later and potentially, if you have more information than I have available, like physiological information from clinical trials or real-world studies, you can do a lot better for individual people and in saying what is likely to happen for their lifetimes. But in a general population, this is not a bad way to go. In our case, we're going to work through an example and we're going to say we have a 97% for us. That's our, going to be our contraceptive effectiveness. Secondly, this is a technical thing that I'm going to say, that the failure rate in one year does not depend on the failure rate in other years. We'd call this independence. So if I have, if you have something happen in a particular year that changes that effectiveness, it doesn't affect the year after. This is mostly a mathematical convenience because it makes the calculations easier. We do not necessarily expect this to be true for all contraceptives and all people. So like if you're on the implant on implant, for example, how effective is, is in the first year may change to the second year because if you have the same implant in your arm, the rate at which the hormone comes out of it and into your blood will change over time. It drops off. This is why they last for three years and then you need to get them replaced because that drops below a threshold at which they're considered reliable. The good news is that's more or less all we need to assume. Although there's quite a lot going in there, which is not physiologically realistic, but it's not a bad way to go at the start. So we're going to say we're looking at 20 years of use and 97% effectiveness. Within a particular year, the probability of becoming pregnant is 100% minus that 97%. And the probability of not becoming pregnant is that 97%. What we're really interested in over 20 years is the probability of never being pregnant. How we represent this mathematically is we multiply out the probability of not becoming pregnant in each of those individual years and see how we go. We do this with our 97% becomes 0.97 as a proportion of 1, which would be 100%. And then we multiply this out 20 times. I'm not going to write them all. And that dot 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 means there's more multiplication hidden in here. Wait, so they're multiplied? They're multiplied, yes. Okay. And if you multiply a number smaller than 1 by another number smaller than 1, it will shrink. In mathematical notation, we would write this as 0 0.97 to the 20, which means you multiply it out 20 times. That turns out to be 0 0.54, which is 54%. You have this 97% effective contraceptive every year, but over 20 years, Roughly half of people actually have at least one pregnancy. That is a lot that is a less lot. effective, right? <laughs> Incredible. That's one of the things that's shocking to people when I tell them about this, is it drops off quite steadily over that 20 years. And this is something patients don't know about. So if you look at your various contraceptive options and you say, okay, 97% sounds quite good, and it is quite good in comparison to nothing, and don't let everybody, anybody tell you otherwise, but in the long term, it's still not nearly as effective as people think. For comparison, let's have a look at some other ones. So if we have a 99.5% effective, what do we get? 0 0.995 to the 20, which means you multiply it 20 times. And that turns out to be 0 0.90, approximately. There's some decibels after that, but let's go with it. So that's 90% effective over 20 years, which okay. is way better yeah in that 2.5 percent you have it's a, there's a huge difference <laughs> a massive right difference, yeah this is only one in ten as opposed to one in two to give you a bit of a surprise let's look at something worse so 90 percent effective 
which is going to be 0 0.9 to the 20. Oh boy, you're in for a surprise. 12%. Shit! If you have a 90% effective year on year, 88% of people expect to have a pregnancy at some point. At least one. These small differences in percentage, right? They, these really do add up in the longer time scale. So if you're doing it for five years, you can run a similar calculation. Uh, I'll have to pull up a calculator for this. But if you want five years, what you do is you take the 0 0.97, whoop, that's a 7, and you'd raise it to the fifth power. That gives us an 85% effectiveness. The same calculation can be done on shorter timescales. Yeah. But this is still not a conversation that doctors have with patients. It's a similar idea in the sense that a more effective contraceptive on the single year will still be more effective over the long term. But how much that effectiveness changes matters. Yeah, 12% from 90s. <laughs> oh, it's pretty bad. Staggering. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. And what's, what's really throws me about this is that even websites with information about birth control don't discuss this. Wikipedia's page on comparing birth control methods only has this first year effectiveness statistic. Yeah. And that's just kind of standard. Now, I have to stress, because I am a pedantic statistician, that this is a rough estimate for a population, right? So if you have... 100,000 people, this is the sort of thing you would expect to see over that entire population. What happens for an individual may not be this experience. Some people will become pregnant, some people will not. That individual's life history is not determined by this chance, it's just a population representation. I have to stress as well that for people who do not want to be pregnant in any period of time, this is worlds better than nothing. I refuse to let anybody use this recording as an argument against contraceptives in general. For a point of comparison, the quote-unquote effectiveness of no contraceptive is 15%. Yeah. That means 15% of people in the first year of not using contraceptives are, pro are going to become pregnant, or would probably become pregnant would be a better way to phrase that. What that looks like over 20 years is you get a number with 17 zeros after the decimal point before you get to a three. So it's minuscule. Basically, over 20 years, unless you have an infertility problem, chances are you are going to have at least one pregnancy without contraceptives. And you're likely to have a lot more pregnancies as well. One of the things that people forget about what happened before the advent of contraceptives is how many pregnancies people would have over the lifetime. Like, you would have seven to ten surviving children, potentially, but you, that's an awful lot of time spent pregnant, breastfeeding, or both. It has changed remarkably over the last hundred years. As promised, we also need to talk a bit about how these effectiveness numbers are calculated in the first place. Information packs and sex education classes usually give one or both of two statistics that get called perfect use and typical use. Ideal or perfect use generally means that the statistic was calculated from clinical trials of the method which have pretty strict adherence guidelines, but at the same time, clinical trials tend to exclude people whose physiology may interact with the contraceptive in a way that makes it more or less effective. So they're not a good representation of the general population. This isn't necessarily bad, depending on what it is. So if you have people who are known to have risks associated with a medication family, you probably wouldn't have them in the clinical trial on the basis that their safety may be compromised if they're in it. Yeah. That's fair enough. There's also stuff like hormonal contraceptives, so the pill, the contraceptive implant, are known to be less effective in people with large bodies because there's m the hormone, or even this is true of a lot of drugs in general, is less effective when it's that diluted. So there is a, a, a threshold of weight, for example, where you're not recommended to be on the pill yeah. because the effectiveness drops off. This is also not necessarily something that is discussed with patients or is discussed with patients in a way that is incredibly fat phobic and just makes them feel like shit all the time. Yeah, so does that mean the clinical trial would have weight restrictions as well 
potentially. I there have been hundreds of clinical trials on this stuff, and I haven't looked at every single one. Yeah. But it's not uncommon to have particularly large people or people with health complications excluded from clinical trials. Right. That's a company. Medical stuff is complicated. And the science of medicine is not nearly as clear-cut as it tends to be presented to the public. Typical use, on the other hand, is generally you go out into the real world, you look at a whole bunch of people who are using the contraceptive in their everyday lives, and you see what happens in terms of whether or not they become pregnant. The difficulty with the typical use thing is that you don't have control over a lot of covariates. By covariates, I mean other things that can get in the way up to and including proper use of the contraceptive. So for the condom, for example, typical use statistics include did not use it a particular time that the person had sex, which means that the typical use statistic for condoms may not actually represent the true, in quotation marks, effectiveness if you even just use one. So stuff like the pill, if you forget to take doses, that's not uncommon. Yeah. But it does change the way that the contraceptive works. Now we're going to have a look at some examples. The first one gets called the male condom, but that's a shade transphobic, so I'm calling it dick condoms. The pill and the implant. The first two are here because they're extremely common, and the last one because it is the most effective, even more so than IUDs, and relatively few people know about it. We're going to look at the first year perfect use and typical use as reported in, I'm going to put this in the show notes, the paper is Trussell, 2011, and this is a paper that is widely cited for these statistics. It's kind of, it, it refers to a whole bunch of clinical trials and summarizes what comes out of them, or even like observational studies and summarizes what comes out of them and has then itself been referred to. Like Wikipedia has this, a summary of other research. The perfect use for the dick condom in the first year was 98%, for the pill was 99.7%, and for the implant was 99.95%. I'll put these percentages in here. But I'm going to put a big asterisk next to that for a reason we'll talk about soon. Yep. In the typical use, for the dick condom, it drops to 82%. Which, if you think back to our uh, demonstration of the 20-year effectiveness, looks pretty bad yeah. already. <laughs> for the pill, it's 91%. Again, not, not great. great. For the implant, it's going to get another 99.95% and a big fat asterisk. So right away we can see the pill and condoms have a much lower effectiveness in typical use compared to their perfect use, and lower effectiveness in the implant overall. Yep. Let's talk about that asterisk. I'm going to quote directly from this Trussell paper. Not one of 15 clinical studies has reported an implant on failure. However, pregnancies during use of Implanon have been reported. We arbitrarily set the perfect use and typical use failure rates for Implanon at 0.05%. So the 0.05% failure converts to a 99.95% effectiveness, right? They pulled it out of their ass. Well, there are reasons to give it a high number if you have 15 clinical studies with no pregnancies because that's roughly one in 2,000 users who would expect to see a failure in their first year, right? But they did not really do the analysis that they could have with the information that was in front of them. You can do better. In fact, we're going to do better. Okay, hell yeah. <laughs> I went and had a look. Among those 15 studies, there were 4,000 593 participants. That's quite a large number of people. None of them had a pregnancy over the course of those studies. That's four and a half thousand data points that you can use to make a reasonably justified estimate. You don't have to go, oh, we had a guess that seemed reasonable, right? You, you can use this information. It's right there in front of you. One very basic method of this is to use what's called half the level of detection which is the minimum number of events that you could identify. So in your four and a half thousand participants, the smallest number of pregnancies you can detect is one. So our level of detection is one pregnancy in 4,593 people. If you go for half the level of detection, which is a standard that's used in a bunch of safety stuff, for example, so workplace health and safety, you have thresholds that are based on this. 
half of one pregnancy in that many people is one pregnancy in twice that many people. So half level of detection is one in 9,186 people. This gives us an estimated effectiveness of 99.989%, which is pretty close to 99.95, but considerably better justified. Yes. This is for the clinical trials? Yep. Well, I, I didn't look at the typical use stuff because I have better data that we're going to talk about in a second. But you can still do things with the people who don't become pregnant. That is information that you can use. And this paper didn't and is potentially one of the most widely cited sources of this statistic. So I'm going to put in black under here that 99.989%, which is what we've estimated as a reasonable actual value for this. Okay, now that that particular bit of rage is out of the way, <laughs> we're going to look at the three-year typical use. So this is from a different paper which looked at a global study across different contraceptive methods for what happened in three years of use as opposed to just the one. And so this is Polis et al. 2016. What they asked people in this case was, have you been using the same method for three years? What has happened over that time? Did you become pregnant? And so the three-year typical use for the dick condom was 84% effective. For the pill was 84.9% effective. And for the implant, this is real world in situ, was 98.9% effective. I would say this three-year typical use is probably a reasonable estimate for long-term behavior. Yep. You could do some stuff with this to talk to patients about their long-term contraceptive use that you can't do with, for example, the first year perfect use numbers. Yes. We're going to use this to do better calculations of the expected use over 20 years. Yep. Originally, what we had was our percentage raised to the number of years. So it was no 20 years, right? But because we have three-year intervals, we need to change that because it's no longer we're looking at 20 years in three-year blocks. But the good news is that's relatively easy to change, because we just divide the exponent by three. So what that would look like for the dick condoms is 0 0.84 raised to the power of 20 divided by three. You get 31% effectiveness for the dick condom. You get 33% effectiveness for the pill. And... 92.9% effectiveness for the implant. My god. <laughs> it's a world of difference, right? That is insane. Again, this is population level statistics. It does not take into account the way that a person's fertility will change over time. Yeah. But that's not a bad guide for long-term use. No, I'm just astounded that this is not information talked about. To be perfectly honest, doctors don't necessarily have the statistical training to talk about this stuff yeah. well. And it's not necessarily widely advertised because to a lot for the end user, what's probably the most important information is which is the best, in quotation marks, form of contraception. Yeah. But if you cannot take different forms of contrac contraception or if things are a consideration for you, like I don't particularly want to get a needle stuck into my arm to implant something or I don't want to get go through a procedure to get an IUD... This long-term use really matters because that might change your mind about the risk you're willing to take in using a contraceptive or not. Yeah. No, that makes complete sense. Thank you, Bart, and uh, we'll see you next time.